let's bring in senior writer from the National Review, former editor of National Review Online. He is one of my favorite people to read on the subject of politics and just about anything else. He is, of course, the great Charles C.W. Cook. Charles, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. And I love that my introduction was segued to mistakes as the result of birthday sex. It was probably appropriate. (laughs) Well, it's it's a pleasure to have you on. I was on your podcast a couple of years ago, and it was a delightful interview. And uh, I have really enjoyed through this weird political cycle that we're going through in 2024 in America your thoughts uh, on a daily basis of uh, of what's going on and particularly what's going on with Kamala Harris and the Democratic ticket. There's a lot to sort through here, and I want to get to some fun questions with you as well. I don't want to just hammer you with uh, questions that are in your political wheelhouse for the entire interview, but I really would like to pick your brain a little bit. What do you make, as the Democratic National Convention rolls on, what do you make of the situation that we're in here where we've gotten Biden essentially pushed out, Kamala didn't get any votes in the primaries, now she's in here, she's not talking to the media, it's unclear what some of the policies are, and yet the media is just lapping it up like mother's milk. Take me through it, smarten me up, and tell me what the hell is going on, Charles. Well, I think if you go back to the moment the debate started and people said, hmm, does Biden have a cold? Is Biden tired? And ended up saying, wow, how can that guy be president? You've basically seen a period in American history that has been almost entirely run by the press. And for two or three years, anyone who said that Biden seemed too old to be president, was told they were a conspiracy theorist or misinformation or they'd given into cheap fakes, a word that seems to have been made up to defend Biden. And then the debate happened and on a dime, the whole thing shifted and the press suddenly started doing its job. And all we heard about for weeks was Biden, 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 Biden. Then they got Biden out finally, and they haven't mentioned it since. It's an astonishing thing if you think about it. We have a president who is apparently too old to run again, would lose if he ran again. All of these horrific stories of him forgetting people's names. And since he decided he would step down as the nominee, no one said a word, but he's still running the country. And instead of focusing on that, the press has decided to create this avatar, this emoji Kamala Harris that doesn't really exist, doesn't have any policies, doesn't talk to the press doesn't do interviews or take questions. So I I think it's been the most astonishing thing I've ever seen since I moved to the United States, that essentially the whole thing is a complete invention and contrivance of the media. And the question for me is whether or not that's sustainable. I suspect it's probably not, but the election's quite soon. It's only, what, 74 days away? It is creeping up. And it seems like an eternity since the assassination attempt on Donald Trump That is almost, it's like that happened 20 years ago now. It never comes Mm -hmm. up. Nobody says anything about it. It it, it seems like a distant memory. What what is going on with Trump's campaign? Is it just, is it strategical blunders on, on his part? Is it just that's what happens when the mainstream media gets in lockstep on pushing a particular narrative? But it seems like Trump was looking like he was in pretty strong position going into the Republican convention in Milwaukee. And now here we are in, and it's Kamala, Kamala, Kamala everywhere you go. How how do you read this looking at it dispassionately? If you were handicapping this thing, like a horse race, what do you see the most likely outcome being when we get to November? Well, you you asked first off, you know, what what what's happening, and I think both of the things you said are happening. So I think Trump is ill-disciplined. He seems to actually do better when he's quiet, uh, and also the media is fluffing up Harris, and the two things together are quite difficult to overcome. 
You know, this has always been Trump's problem is he can be really charismatic and he can break through in a way many others don't. And he reaches voters. Republicans often don't. But then, you know, the next day he'll go out and he'll say something completely ridiculous that's off message. And that's all that will get reported. And that does seem to be what's happening. At the same time, Harris is an avatar, as I said. So I, you've got both happening at the same time and they don't really help Trump and they do help her. But um, I just don't think it's sustainable. I mean, it's difficult to predict what will happen with Trump because he's so mercurial. You, you don't know whether he's going to be disciplined or crazy. But she is not what she's being sold as. I mean, to get to where she currently is, she's had to drop every policy she's ever had. She didn't do this in person. She didn't do this in an interview. She didn't write why she changed her mind. Her aides told journalists, oh, she no longer believes that thing she once believed. The one foray into policy she's had has been a mess. Even the Washington Post called her out. And she's not very talented as a politician. I mean, she was the most disliked vice president in the history of polling. She flamed out in 2019 with 3% of the vote. I think I'm right in saying she was winning 0% of the vote in her home state of California in 2019. I just don't think you can inflate her into what she's supposed to be for too long. Uh, so in terms of what's going to happen in November, the answer is I don't know. I think it's a pretty close election. I think at the moment she is winning it very slightly, but I think her momentum has stalled. We keep being told about vibes in this election. I think the vibes are shifting away from Harris. I'm not necessarily saying they're shifting back toward Trump, but I think a lot of that uh, honeymoon period is over. And it, it doesn't seem to have translated to the convention either. Who knows? Maybe tonight's uh, speech will be amazing and everyone will love it. But I, I think that people are beginning to see through the ruse. Charles, how much does a vice presidential candidate matter? And why is Tim Walls beloved <laughs> in a short time and J.D. Vance, here's basically what I have learned, Charles, this summer. J.D. Vance fucks couches, and Tim Walls <laughs> is apparently Vince Lombardi. I've never seen somebody get more mileage out of being an assistant high school football coach. He's, a, he's, he's Bill Belichick, and J.D. Vance is a couch fucker. Uh, does it matter at the end of the day, really? The, who the vice presidential candidate is, or in an election that's this close, could Tim Walls being more popular than J.D. Vance, at least if we believe sort of the narrative that we're being fed, could that be yeah. a difference maker? I mean, the funny thing about the two examples you gave, of course, is that neither of them are true, right? I mean, the couch right. thing was yeah. just made up and it's been repeated, including by Walls. Uh, and Walls is a serial liar, and is not who he insists that he is. Uh, so it doesn't matter that much. Uh, it's, it, it matters if you can use it to really get at the heart of the campaign. Um, so in one sense, I suppose at the margins, it does matter. Because if they can tie the J.D. Vance stuff to Trump and make it seem as if you know, J.D. Vance's flaws are Trump's flaws, maybe that matters. And if they can transfer Tim Walz's dishonesty and shape-shifting nature to to Harris, then maybe it matters. But I, I do think political journalists love to focus a lot on this stuff when really it's about the candidates themselves. One last political question here for me. I, I'm going to kick it over to Ronnie T-Shirts and let him ask you a question. God, God bless you. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> but the last question that, that I want to ask you uh, on sort of the political climate, I guess, is it uh, the, the media... I remember I've been liberal for most of my life. I voted Democrat in seven out of eight presidential elections that I've voted in. And I have watched things change within that party with, with sort of how it's become much more uh, pro-censorship, curtailing free speech, which really is a major turnoff for me. And so I've sort of found myself probably a little right of center at this point mm -hmm. in my life, but I feel like the ground shifted under me more than, more than I had great philosophical shifts myself. I want to ask you two questions here, kind of unrelated. The media, 
I used to hear Rush Limbaugh once in a while, and he would rail about the media, the media, the media, the media. And I used to think, ah, this fucking guy, you know, what what the fuck's he talking about? This is just right-wing propaganda, whatever. And now I look at it, and I'm like, geez, the, the media really seems to be almost a wing of the Democrat Party in mm. in this year. How much of a role does that play and why why is it and are they aware that they're doing it? Do like if you flip on CNN or MSNBC or any of a Politico, you've been talking about some online, do they think that they're being fair? Are they nose blind to their biases or or what's or, how do you explain it? It's hard for me to understand how the media can be so slanted as I view it. And yet Mm -hmm. so many other people just don't see it or claim that they don't see it. Oh, it's a huge problem. I it's, it's a catastrophic problem. And it's why the media's approval rating is about 11%, which I think is, you know, it's lower than syphilis. It's just the the (laughs) mediating institution and that it, it, is between politics and and people it's it's just abusing that power it's corruption that's what it is there's an absolutely massive problem and it's got so so much worse the media's always been a little bit biased to the left but if you compare where it was 30 40 years ago to where it is now there's no comparison i mean i think one of the reasons that so many of them some of them know what they're doing but i think one of the reasons so many of them don't know what they're doing um, is that they live in the sort of bubbles that they decry in others. If you look at, say, uh, when people on the left will talk about the need for diversity, um, the argument is that if you have people who are all the same, then you get groupthink, right? Now, unfortunately, in our contemporary era, they have changed the meaning of the word diversity away from people who think differently and towards people's immutable characteristics, which is actually the least important and interesting thing about someone, what skin color they are, whether they're straight or gay. There's no reason to care about that. Um, but they're right in the sense that diversity, as it should be understood, can be important because you want someone in the room who's going to say, that's a stupid idea, or, well, actually, I'm from that town and no one would think that or what you will. And I just don't think you see it uh, in mainstream journalistic institutions. I think they all come out of the same colleges and they all attend the same um parties uh, and they all have the same kind of worldview and they can't understand that half the country disagrees with them um and so what you get is this this crazy one-sided output that is probably made worse by the fact that people running the place do know what they're doing and are and are setting an agenda charles do you worry about the future of free speech in this country i look at canada and i look at i look at the uk and I see the direction that things are going, and I feel like we are behind them on the same road, and maybe there's time for us to take a detour or get off of that road before we get to the point that these places are at. And who knows how much further it's going to go uh, beyond where it is now, even in, even in those places. Do you Do you fear for sort of like in some ways the fundamental essence of America that people have a right to free speech and can can say what they think. I sometimes wonder what this election cycle would look like if Elon Musk hadn't purchased X. Whatever the criticisms are of Elon, X really is the the only exception kind of to um, having things that you say that aren't popular potentially deplatformed. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. I've wondered the same thing. I mean, with free speech, the way I would put this is is a paradox here, which is that legally, as in the Supreme Court's willingness to uphold free speech, the United States has never been freer. And culturally, it may never have been worse. The history of American free speech law uh, is really tumultuous. I mean, early on in the Republic, you get the Alien and Sedition Act under President John Adams. So it's 1798. That's just a few years after the Constitution's written. You had all sorts of restrictions on abolitionist speech, gag orders in Congress. Um, you had restrictions during the Woodrow Wilson administration, the Sedition Act, where he even managed to arrest and imprison his opponent, Eugene Debs, <laughs> and uh, people who were against the First World War uh, were put in jail. 
uh, en masse. So America has been through difficult times and the Supreme Court blessed all of that. Well, it doesn't now. I mean, we have a Supreme Court that pretty much always nine to nothing, occasionally eight to one, upholds free speech. That's really good. That's the upside. The downside is that at the same time, uh, our culture, especially the elite parts of our culture in academia and the media and increasingly in corporations, is hostile toward free speech and is making it quite difficult for people um, to express themselves uh, to the point at which it gets people fired if they express themselves. And what worries me is twofold. First off, after a point, there's no real great advantage to having a Supreme Court and a set of laws that will uphold free speech if culturally people who speak freely pay a hefty price for it. And second, the people who are currently the most opposed to free speech, who at the moment are in you know Harvard Law School, will eventually be on that Supreme Court. And if they don't share the same conceptions as the current Supreme Court, well, the law will change as well. So I am very worried about it. I think this is a fight we need to have culturally, uh, because although at the moment, Americans thankfully can go to the court in many cases and say, they're trying to shut me up, stop them, that won't hold forever if we lose our love of free expression. All right, Ronnie T-shirts, you're standing by. This is, we're going to, we're going to see what happens when we bring in a gentleman and a scholar and a man of letters and then we bring in Ronnie T-shirts. Ronnie, meet Charles. Charles, meet Ronnie. Hi, Ronnie. Hi, Charles. Let 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 it go. Let it go, Ronnie. What's on so, your mind? So I guess the biggest reason that Ricky has me as his uh, his his sidekick, his co-host, is because I'm here to ask the hard hitting questions, the ones, okay. the questions that other people just they're afraid they're afraid to go to. So my dumb American brain just automatically assumes that because you're from england <laughs> that you like soccer or football as you call it and so you see i've got a ipswich town oh shirt yeah on. yeah so my question and i feel like everybody wants to know and wants to know so much that ricky made a proclamation at the beginning of our show that if you do indeed like football and if you have a favorite epl team he will adopt that as his team because he doesn't have one right now. Okay. Well, there's good news for Ricky then. My dad's actually from Manchester and he has been a Manchester United fan since the Munich air disaster of 1958. Um, I don't know if you know about that, but the team went over to play in Europe and uh, they were taking off in this plane and it was snowy on the runway and the plane crashed and it wiped them out. And in Manchester where my dad was from, this was a you know huge thing because it was their local team. So yeah, I grew up, as my whole family did, as a fanatical Manchester United fan, uh, which was good when I was a kid because they used to be incredible. They were the they were the New York Yankees of soccer for a while. Not not so much recently, sadly. Well, Ricky, it looks like you're a Man U fan now. Boom! There it is. It happened. <laughs> I'm I'm, <laughs> not, I'm riding with Charles. It, and on Charles, this. Charles, are I we good? Do, Charles, are a, we good? Are we good? Oh, are we I good? I have a now? serious Charles. question. Can I ask a serious okay. question of Charles? All right. Please. If the rumor is true that RFK Jr. is going to drop out tomorrow, what effect do you think that'll have on, uh, I guess, polling now and I guess what happens in November? Well, I think if RFK Jr. drops out and doesn't endorse anyone, it might be a wash because it looks as if about half and half um, his support came from Harris and, and Trump. But I do think, uh, people disagree on this, but I do think that if he drops out and endorses Trump, it will help Trump. I mean, those voters are RFK Jr. voters for a reason. They like the guy. They trust the guy. They think that his policy positions are preferable or his character is preferable to those of Harris and Trump. And I just think if you've put yourself in that position and then the person who you wanted to support says, well, I'm dropping out this person, Presumably, Trump is a is a better option than the other one. I think it must marginally help Trump. So um, I, I would I would expect to see a little bit of a boon for Trump, and it might help him in swing states as well. Um, I don't think it'll necessarily swing the election, but if the election is very very close, and it seems to be, then it it could. Ronnie, do you want to follow yeah. up? Yeah, no, I, uh, I, you know, the the rumor out there was that that RFK Jr. was going to support Trump, and so I guess 
when I asked the question, I was just automatically assuming that that what I was hearing was true, which is kind of a that that, that, that that's on me for assuming that what I was reading and hearing was true. So, um, yeah, good answer. Awesome. All right, let's let's have a little bit of fun, Charles. We put okay. you through the paces here uh, in your expert role. Um, you're a sports fan, I know, yes. and you are you're a Jacksonville Jaguars fan, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. So you you are, which I don't know the juxtaposition of that because the Jaguars, for whatever reason, you know, it just seems like they're some guy from Florida who's wearing flip-flops and cut off jean shorts as a Jaguars fan. And here you are classing (laughs) up the entire organization. Um, What do you think about the NFL season in general? I mean, do do you play fantasy? Are you just excited primarily about the Jags? What are you looking forward to this year? We're getting close to, we're getting close to kickoff time. Yeah. So I do play fantasy and obviously I'm primarily excited about the Jags, but I actually, I just watch every NFL game that I can. I mean, this is the best time of the year, right? Cause you've got baseball, you've got football, you've got English premier league soccer's come back and they all happen at the same time. And then college football. Um, so what am I most excited about? Well, I am a season ticket holder for the Jags. So I'm pretty much looking forward to that. I think I'm going to go to a bunch of road games as well. I mean, last year's season was sort of ended disastrously because they were eight and three. There was a point in the season where they were the number one seed in the AFC. And I actually have a photograph on my, I took on my iPhone of the screen when they were in that position because it's never happened before while I've been a fan. And then they collapsed and I ended up bar hopping in Nashville, Tennessee when they lost on the last day of the season and missed the playoffs. So I'll be honest with you, I'm going into this season a little bit lower in my expectations because last year killed me. Um, But you know, they could they could make the playoffs. They could go nine and eight, maybe maybe ten and seven. Um, but I just love the fact that on a on a Thursday and a Sunday and a Monday, and I think this year there are some Friday games. Certainly in the first week there's a Friday game. Uh, you can spend your evening watching football, um, and then Saturday college football. It's just the best thing. My wife despairs of it, of course, but. Um, when it goes away, there's just such a massive loss for about six months and we're about to get it back. Um, and in fantasy, I, I'm now in like three fantasy leagues because we there's one I've been in forever. And then as my wife's family does one and then uh, National Review has one as well. So I think I'm going to have to juggle fantasy leagues again. Do you like American football better than football? I like Between American football two? more than any other sport. Yeah. Wow. All right. Good judge. Good judgment there i'm gonna i'm gonna concur although i am a man U fan now so exactly passionate i've gotta i've gotta yeah passionate i've <laughs> gotta get i've gotta get some gear uh is gonna be the next step you tweeted the other day about aaron judge and what an incredible talent he is and how blessed we are in in this day and age to be able to see him play i think you tweeted something to the effect that you know, you know, one day your your kids will be able to like say, "Hey, I I saw right. Aaron Judge play, and it and it will be a big deal." Um, how how much of a baseball fan are, are you? Are the Yankees your team? Who's your team? And and you know, tell me a little bit more about how much you just have an appreciation for watching his greatness because he he definitely I think is taking his place among. The, the greatest of all time. And we're, we're realizing that in real time as he, as he continues to put up these prodigious numbers. Yeah. So I am a Yankees fan. My teams are weird. Cause what happened was I moved to America and I didn't have any teams, obviously. And I, the first city I lived in was New York and I got into baseball first. So I became a Yankees fan because my wife was a Yankees fan. I picked the local team. It's a good team, but it was a local team. And then when I moved to Florida and got into football, the two local teams were the Jaguars and the Gators. So I, I picked those up. So I'm a Yankees, Jaguars, Gators fan, which I suppose is odd. Um, so my kids play um, Little League. And when we show up at the the field for the games and for the practices, there's a big billboard of Babe Ruth there. And they're obsessed with this and they know who Babe Ruth is. Um but because Babe Ruth played in the past, I think then they sort of imbue Babe Ruth with a certain greatness that he deserves, but also that is what you do when you look at old photographs of anyone. It, it, they, they seem more magical because they were uh, playing 100 years ago. 
And I keep trying to explain this to my kids. Like, I'm not saying Aaron Judge will literally be Babe Ruth, but they are actually living through somebody that they watch every night on the TV or if we take them to games who is in that pantheon, you know, who's going to end up in the same breath as Roger Maris and and Babe Ruth and and so on, Lou Gehrig. and Jackie Robinson, but I, I, they sort of half believe me and they love watching him. But I think because it's happening now, they can't they can't quite understand this. And so it just sort of interested me. Like, I, I can't convey to them that, that what they're seeing is not normal. Like, this is not a, oh, this is the best player on the Yankees. This is this is a phenom, you know, like Otani is or Mike Trout. Um, not just a great player on the team, but something they will remember forever. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. You don't appreciate it sometimes in the moment that you're watching it. And then when the years go by, you look back, I would give anything to see some of the guys that I took for granted when I was a kid play in their prime just one more time. Uh, That's a great point. All right. Well, one of my favorite things to ask people, I'm going to ask you this before we get you out of here today. And you've been beyond great music, music. What, what, What kind of music are you into? Favorite bands, Favorite albums, anything, anything of, of of that nature. I always think you can learn something about somebody from their their musical taste. Yeah, so I like a lot of music. I I mean, I am above all else a Beatles super fan. I actually did a seven or eight hour uh, audio documentary on the Beatles for NR, and we went right through the beginning of um, the Beatles to the end. Um, I, I, I think the Beatles are the greatest group that's ever existed, but I mean, I like a lot of different sorts of music. I really like Southern rock. Um, I'm a big jazz guy. You know, we were having this conversation yesterday, actually, like who's the greatest female vocalist. I think Ella Fitzgerald hands down, but my next would be probably Patsy Cline and then Etta James in an honorable third. Um, and I grew up, uh, I grew up in a, a choir school. So classical music was, uh, was a big part of my my life as well. So I mean, we could do this. We could do this all day. But if I'm picking oh. the band that is my uh, sort of Mount Rushmore band, it's it's the Beatles. Okay, they're my favorite band too. We're going to extend this a couple of minutes because I want to talk yeah. about the Beatles with you. My favorite band as well. My favorite album. It's hard to have a favorite Beatles album, right? I it, I and it varies. Probably de- depends on the the month or the year that you ask me. But I think my favorite Beatles album overall is probably Revolver. What, okay. What's your favorite? Um, I think it's Abbey Road. It's difficult, but I think it's probably Abbey Road. I think that second side with the long segue and it all just runs into each other is just brilliant. But you know, you know what's killing me is Giles Martin, George Martin's son, has been remixing and remastering the Beatles and cleaning them up. So I don't know, you probably heard the the remix revolver and they re-released the blue and the red albums which are these compilation albums and so like he's done because say half of rubber soul is on them or you know a bunch of songs from help or or hard days of night or what you will he's done half of those albums <laughs> and i have this horrible fear that he's going to get hit by a bus and then we're going to be <laughs> left with like a half remastered remixed version of you know uh, Hard Day's Night, where half the songs have been cleaned up and sound great, but then we only have the older versions of the other ones. So this is my, at the moment, I'm just like, I'm just desperate for him to finish the project because it's, it's been so great. <laughs> he needs to be placed under protection exactly. with a, a full staff <laughs> medical team. This is a, this exactly. is a mission that he's on for humanity. Uh, I couldn't agree yeah, more. No, the, the, the Blue Album was, that was my introduction. I got an eight track tape of the of the blue album when I was a kid and it had the great I love the uh I love the James Bond intro on help. Yeah, <laughs> I, that that's yeah. the you know the, I, I do love that intro on it, which you don't get on the uh the the uh the English release, right? It, it doesn't mm-hmm. have that. That was but but my God, yeah, Revolver Hard Days Nights underrated too. I think oh, people yeah. just kind of gloss through the other stuff. You go back to a hard days night and my God it, it's you know, it's almost sonic perfection. I, I saw the original Ed Sullivan performance not long ago, and it's just astonishing how tight they were and how yeah. great they sounded, knowing that they were being watched by everybody. And they went out there and just all my loving, just pitch perfect. 
Uh, unbelievable. I, I agree with you. Absolutely the greats. Well, uh, Charles, good luck to the uh, to the Jaguars, Thank I believe. You. I can't say it like you do, but you, uh, you say it so well. <laughs> and uh, good luck with your fantasy teams. I hope that you bring home at least one championship this year. Me too. And uh, I'll, I'll be following you for uh, the best takes on what's going on with this Harris campaign and what's going on with this 2024 election in the meantime, my friend. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure. Thank you so much. We'd love to have you on again sometime. The great Charles C.W. Cook joining us today and delightful, delightful. A guy who can seg seamlessly from the most important topics to the kind of fun topics that we enjoy exploring on this show. Hey, OutKick fans on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and make your way over to OutKick.com where you can watch the full episode.